Two weeks ago, we began talking about seed time and harvest and the power that's within a seed and the par parallel between the, the spiritual and the natural realm. If you have your Bibles, if you would open, you should be close if you're in Genesis chapter 2. Turn to Genesis chapter 11, if you would. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 1. I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation. And it shows us how God created things. It says, Then God said, Let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed-bearing plant, and trees that grow seed-bearing fruit. These seeds will then produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they came, and that is what happened. In other words, the law of Genesis, everything produces after its own kind. After the original creation of things in adult form, God placed within them, within plants, within animals, within humans, seed to be able to reproduce after their own kind. And it's the same way spiritually producing we see ourselves, your spirit is created after God in righteousness and true holiness, but it tells us in 1 Peter that we are born again of incorruptible seed, which is the word of God. So the way things are done naturally is also the way things are done spiritually. Now we know that seeds can remain, natural seeds can remain for a long period of time, and they'll be dormant until the proper conditions are met. Within every seed, and we looked at this two weeks ago, there lives a tiny plant or an embryo. And when you hold, think about this, you can hold in your hand a mighty massive oak tree in seed form. You can hold hundreds of flowers in your hand in seed form. Not in its adult capacity, but in seed form. Form. Now, the outer covering is called the seed coat, and when the seed is exposed to the proper conditions, the water, the oxygen, the sun, uh, that's taken in that oxygen, that water, through that seed coat, the embryo uh, begins to enlarge. It breaks through that seed coat. First of all, the roots begin to go down, and then the stem comes forth. And we talked about a lot that takes place underneath the ground that you do not see before anything pops through the dirt, which you do see. And faith operates the same way. Remember, faith is the evidence of what you don't see. And when I pray, I believe that God hears me and goes to work, even though I may not see any difference. Even though with Edgar, things seemed in the natural to get worse, I have to still believe that that seed is working where I don't see it, and it will manifest and show up eventually where I do see it. The, the plant comes forth. Jesus said, first with the corn, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. It doesn't shoot up right away as a mature plant. It takes time. It's the same with the fruit of the Spirit we see in Galatians, the love, joy, peace, patience, uh, all of those things. When you become a believer in Christ, they're on the inside of you. They're a part of your new nature in seed form. You don't need more patience. You don't need more love. You don't need those things. What you and I have to do is take what we have, develop them, and see them begin to grow and have them in the right condition of our heart. So when I have examples that take place throughout my day, as we had mentioned, you're in the, the grocery store. Uh, I use this example of fair amount because it happens all the time where you're in a line and you're waiting and waiting and waiting and they're doing a price check and things and, and your line stops and all the other lines begin to move, move really fast and then you change lines and that line slows down and then the one you're in begins to speed up and you can begin to have frustration build up. Well, what happens at that point? You and I have a decision to make. We can either develop the seed within us as patience or we cannot and stay immature in that area. So once I begin to stand in that line and I'm like, Lord, okay, I'm just going to relax here, take a deep breath, and I'm just going to begin to talk to you or quote scripture or have a good attitude. You purposely choose that. What happens is that embryo is breaking forth through that seed coat, or if it already has done that, it's beginning to develop more under the ground, and pretty soon that patience is going to begin to sprout forth. If you think about it, fruit on a tree is not for the tree itself, it's for others to partake of. The fruit of the Spirit, yes, you're blessed by it, but it's generally for others 
to partake of. They see the maturity and the growth in your life. Well, I'm going to take that, that love fruit. Man, that person walks in love no matter what happens to them. They walk in, in kindness, and, and their people are partaking fruit from the life that you're living. They see it, and it affects them. And like, I want that same thing in my life. And so it opens up a conversation with other individuals. So we see how that begins to work. And again, you were born again of incorruptible seed of the Word of God. So when you heard the word concerning salvation, when you heard that Jesus Christ came to this earth, God in the flesh dies for you to pay for the penalty of your sin, is resurrected, what happens, that seed is planted in your heart. Whether you heard that in a church service, where you're, whether you're sitting over a cup of coffee with someone in discussion, this is brought up about your spiritual well-being. Wherever you hear that, it's planted in your heart when you choose to believe it, that's faith, that adds the proper um, condition for it to grow, and you say, yes, I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior and be born again, that seed begins to now burst forth into eternal life. But just because you're born again, remember, it doesn't mean you're a mature Christian. You and I, that's a daily process of growth and development to be more and more like Christ. So again, it all happens in seed form. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4, if you would. So you receive the promises with your faith in seed form. Your patience holds you steady while the seed is working in the ground of your heart, the unseen realm, until it bursts forth into the natural or seen realm. God's Word is active and alive all the time. The potential is there. Notice Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. I want to read the first part of this out of the Amplified Version. It says, For the word that God speaks is alive and full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. And that's the Bible. That's God's word. So why doesn't it always produce in everybody's life? Why is it that some seem to be a reproduction of God's promises and they're just happening and others don't? That's what we've been looking at starting two weeks ago and we're going to get into a little bit more this week. That's where I was asking the Lord some of these questions of, you know, we, it says the church is to look like this. It says that, and we are the church of, of the living God. You are. You're the temple of the Spirit of God. And, and it says, Lord, we're to be doing these things, but these things don't seem to be happening on a regular basis. Is it that we just continue to stand in faith? Are we missing it somewhere? It's like the Lord prompted my heart, go back to the parable of the sower and the seed. And so we began to do that two weeks ago. And I want to pick up, if you would open your Bibles to um, Matthew chapter 13. It starts in verse 1, verse 1 through 9. We, you can read that on your own. It's the parable. A simple explanation of a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Jesus did this all the time. He, he took complex spiritual things and he made them real simple. See, that's the sign of a good teacher. Someone who can take something difficult and make it simple. Sometimes we think a good teacher is someone who takes something simple and makes it difficult to understand. It's like, wow, they must really be good because I have no idea what they said. Can't comprehend it. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Jesus was very simple, took things that they understood, common everyday occurrences and conditions, and shared deep spiritual truth with them. So what I want us to do, we're going to skip down to verse 18 through 23. We're going to read the interpretation of the parable that Jesus told. Notice what he says, verse 18. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes, snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who learns, excuse me, hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Now, in this passage, notice 
seed is being sown, a farmer's out there sowing seed, and it lands on four different types of soil. You have the road, the wayside, really hard. You've got thorny ground. You've got stony ground that seed's falling into. And you have good ground. Now, it's only in the good ground where there's a production of the seed that is sown. So three out of the four types of soil, they hear it, and there might be a little bit of work that is done in some of the types of soil, but certain things happen to remove the seed out, and there is no fruit that's produced. The goal that we have, and I believe as a Christian, as a believer, you are good soil. Okay, things that are sown in your heart, we talked about last week, that you have faith from God to believe his promises. All right, now that faith can grow and develop, but you have the proper faith that you need. It's not a, a perverted or twisted or busted faith. It comes from him. By grace you're saved through faith out of yourself. It's a gift of God. Grace is a gift. Faith is a gift. All those things are. So it comes from the Lord. But because of the way I handle the seed that is sown, even though I'm good soil, I may not produce the way I'm supposed to produce. Because notice, even in the good ground, which we'll get to next week, 100% is not produced all the time. The potential is there for 100% production all the time, but it doesn't always happen. Sometimes it's 30. Sometimes it's 60. Sometimes it's 100. The goal is to get the maximum amount of production out of the seed as possible. And there are things that you and I do to cause that to happen. The problem is not with the seed, okay? It's the type of soil that it goes into. And so I want to begin to take just a little bit of time and look at these types of soil to make sure that I remain good soil that I don't get to a point where I receive something and it's like the wayside or the thorns or the stones. Now, the, this, this is in, this parable is in different gospels. In Mark, it tells us that the sower sows the word. The sower sows the word. So think about this. God's word is the seed and it has to be sown to reap a harvest. There is... No individual who goes out and tills up the ground of a garden, at least there shouldn't be, and a few months later, people walk by and talk to the person and say, wow, that's, nothing's coming up. And he's like, I don't know what the problem is. I mean, I till up the ground like three months ago, and I don't have anything. Nothing's being produced. And they say, well, well, did you plant seed? Well, no, I didn't plant any seed. I mean, that would be foolish to think you're going to get a harvest without planting any seed. Seed has to be planted. You and I are both planting seed into others and ourselves and receiving that seed from others and spending time in God's Word on your own. So you are both a sower, but also you're the ground in which seed is to be sown. So the sower sows the seed. You're planting God's Word. And notice what it says here in Matthew 13, 19. The King James calls this wayside. Um, NIV says, Anyone who hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. Notice it says they hear, but they don't understand or perceive. Amplified says they do not grasp and comprehend it. The devil steals the truth immediately. See, here's the thing. The devil, there is a devil out there. He's real. He doesn't care about you. You in and of yourself, me in and of myself, you're no threat to him. All right? It's, he doesn't come for, he comes for the seed. There's power in God's word. It's when you and I comprehend God's word, grasp it, apply it, that's when he has problems. He has no problems with a person who receives Christ and remains a spiritual baby and never grows up. That, that's, he's, that, you're off his radar. He could care less about you because you're not doing any damage to the kingdom. You're just, you're just waiting to try to get to heaven, okay? That's all you're doing. Not a problem. He cannot, he cannot afford to have you and I have the seed planted in our heart and begin to produce fruit. And he can't do anything about it. So what he does is he tries to steal it right away. 
This morning what's happening, seeds being planted and the enemy is going to try to come and get you not to act on it. Okay? Now this wayside soil, they don't comprehend it. As a believer, think about it, as a Christian, you do have the, the understanding to comprehend God's word. Because you have it spiritually discerned and you have the spirit of God living on the inside of you. It doesn't mean that you automatically understand it, but if you're doing the right things, he will reveal truth to you. Okay? A person who's not born again, they can read the Bible and gain some intellect and intelligence from it in the sense like the Pharisees did. You know, I, I, can, I understand what's written here. I see that. But the spiritual truth of it, they cannot. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that it's spiritually discerned. They cannot comprehend it. But what happens, unfortunately, in the life of a believer who has the potential to understand the Word of God is that they can become apathetic. I'm going to church again out of habit. I'm sitting there hearing someone drone on and on and on, and I'm waiting for them, looking at my watch. Come on, are you kidding me? And I wonder what the score of the game is right now. And what's, going, what's happening? The Word is going forth. And it's being sown, it's being put out there, but apathy keeps it from taking lodging and going deep into the heart. I'm worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm, I'm concerned that I've got enough burgers and brats for Labor Day and that everyone's going to make it and that the weather's going to be good. And I'm trying to figure everything out with that. And I'm hearing this preacher drone on and on. And all I hear is, you remember the, the wah, 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 wah on, uh, and remember Charlie Brown? You get on, the, was it his teacher? Wah, 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 wah. Like, man, must be spirit filled. Um, speaking in tongues. Need an interpretation on that one. But it's apathy that sets in. We all have to be careful. This ta it takes discipline. I mean, honestly, to, and I, I commend you, thank you for showing up. Thank you for being here. It takes discipline. You could be doing a lot of other things. And once you're here, it takes discipline to stay awake. Okay, now, if you, fall, if you get tired, get up, walk around. Thanks, Tim. He's walking. No, I'm kidding. Um, if you get tired, get up and walk around. If, 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 you, if you fall asleep, I don't care. Okay, I mean, I would like you to stay awake, but I know that there's sometimes you're working long schedules. You're working, I mean, it's tough to stay awake, and you're like, you know what? I want to come to church, and you've just worked an 8, 10, 12-hour shift, and you got off a half hour before church starts, and you show up to church. Why? I want to be there. I want to receive. I want to, uh, I want to hear what God has to say, and you get tired, and your eyes get tired, and you fall asleep. I'm not getting out a super soaker and spraying you, Okay. Sleep, get some rest, okay? Now, if you snore, you might get a nudge, all right? Now, I won't share that. I, there was, uh, I, was, I was thinking, I will. I, uh, everyone, Nona, my, my foster, my Deb's foster um, sister, heart of gold, love her. Nona's in South Shore Care Center. She's been there for a little while. Loves it. Gets along with everybody and, and having a great time. But there was a Wednesday night that she was here in church and, and she was sitting over here. The only one sitting over there. Actually, everyone else was, was here. And Nona gets tired and she'll fall asleep. And, and we're doing our Wednesday night Bible study and all of a sudden I hear this. <laughs> when I look over and notice sawing logs over there, someone was going to go over, just let her sleep. Just let her sleep. She needs her rest. So, but today, if you start snoring, if you're someone sitting next to you, just give them a little bit of a nudge, okay? We don't want to draw attention. But for the most part, what happens with Wayside, what he's referring to here, someone who is apathetic, I really don't care. You know, my spouse is making me come, or I'm just here, you know, biding my time. I really don't care what's being preached. It doesn't matter to me. I'm not really into the God thing too much, or even into church. I'm just, I'm just here, and I really don't care. Okay? The seed's trying to take root, but it's not. And because of that, the enemy comes, takes it away. And you don't think twice about applying the truth that you're hearing. No big deal. Now, my life's pretty good the way that it is and going on. So... This is, this is wayside soil. My prayer is that whenever you come to church, you're open and you're receptive, you're willing and wanting to receive. 
And you don't come with the attitude, preacher, you know, you got to pull a rabbit out of a hat to make me focus on what you're saying. It should be, man, God, uh, your word's coming forth. Even if I don't like the vessel through which the message is coming, even if the message is dull, dry, boring, and I'm having a hard time staying awake, you and I can get to a point where we are disciplined enough to receive from that truth of God's word and grow and mature as a believer because we're applying it. Too many times we're caught up on the vessel delivering the seed than we are upon receiving that seed and applying its truth. And so I pray that you would be, I know you're familiar with this passage, but turn to Acts chapter 17. If you need a Bible, we'll get you a Bible. Now normally we put it up on the, on the screen where we're able to see that and read that, which is fine. But I encourage you, whether it's on your phone, a tablet, a Bible that you actually open and flip pages, if you want one of those, we won't get you a tablet. But if you want a Bible, you flip the pages open, we'd be more than happy to put a Bible into your hands. We've got a great study Bible, the Fire Bible. Those are, are $40 a piece, but tremendous study Bible to really help you get into God's Word and gain some understanding of what is taking place in that passage to help that Word take root in your heart. But I want you to be Acts 17 people, the Bereans, verses 10 and 11. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians. Why? Why were they of more noble? The word noble here in New Living Translation says open-minded. Why were they more open-minded? For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. All right? We all want to be open-minded. How are you open-minded? You take what others share with you, you take what's being shared on a Sunday, and you go home during the week and you look up Scripture, you investigate it, you search it out to see if what's being preached and what's being shared is true or not. Does it line up contextually with Scripture? Is it, and if you have questions, call. I love it. I, I, numerous times people have called and said, hey, I've got a question about this or about that or, or this has been, you know, the Lord's been showing me this. That's exciting. I love that. You're investigating. You're digging in. You're finding that scripture. So you, this, this person, um, you remove yourself from being stony or excuse me, from being the wayside, but don't be, go from being wayside to being stony. Okay, you can go from any of these to being good soil to produce God's word. Look at back in Matthew chapter 13. Look at verses 20 and 21. This is stony ground. We'll, we'll close with the stony ground today. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes, notice this, because of the word, he quickly falls away. In other words, this person hears God's word and they receive it with joy. You ever heard a message or something in that message? It's like it clicked, the light bulb came on. It's like, wow, yes, that's, that's exactly what I need. Or you're having a conversation with someone and they say something and it quickens in your heart. And it's like, yes. That's exactly what I need. You've heard that word. You receive it with joy. You're excited about it. You want to see it produced in your life, but it does not. It does not produce. What happens, you think that's great. I'm going to do what I've heard. See a marvelous change in my life. So you begin to do that. You begin to apply that, but shortly thereafter, problems, notice, and persecution arise to steal the word that, has big, that you've begun to stand on. In other words, let's just say that I today, for the first time, I receive Christ as my Savior. I'm born again, incorruptible seed, eternal life from the inside, and I keep coming to church because I want to grow and I'm reading the Bible. And, and then I hear someone talk about, as we mentioned earlier today, tithing. It's like, what? What's, what's tithing? What, what in the world is that? I, and so you begin to hear about it. You begin to read about it. You begin to look at it and say, oh, I see. Okay, so I see, you know, it's 10% my income. I, I, I give it to the Lord through my local church. And then you're excited about it. Wow, this is awesome. And then you talk to your relatives about it, 
And they're like, you have got, are you serious? 10%? You've got to be crazy. There's no one in their right mind that will give 10% of their income to the church. All, you know all their, they're just out there for money. They don't care about you. If you wouldn't tithe, they'd probably ask you to leave. You know, there, there's no way, there's no, uh, you, you, 10%, that's, that's insane. And what happens now, they've begun to plant seeds in your mind. Huh. Maybe they are, I mean, I trust my relatives, and they're, they're the ones telling me this, and they probably know more about this. And maybe they even say, I tried that tithing thing for a couple of weeks. It does not work. My car broke down. Started doing that. And other bad things happen. And I quit that tithing, and then things seem to kind of even out okay. And it's all right. So they'll tell you stories like that, and it's planting thoughts in your head. And like, huh, I don't know about that then. So the more you dwell, here, here's the key. It's what you meditate on. It's what you think on. It's what you dwell on that's going to powerfully affect you. You have a decision to make to either reject that and say, no, 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 I'm going to go back and search the scriptures again and keep looking at it and fill your mind with that. Yeah, I see it in God's word. It doesn't matter what my relatives say. I'm going to do that and apply it. Okay, now you're moving to good soil. But what a stony person will do is they'll give up on it. They begin to stand on that. Yes, they're excited about it. But the things that they hear, the persecution, the troubles that come in, or you begin to start, like I said, and something breaks down, and then something else happens, and it may be the enemy just trying to frustrate you, discourage you, get you to give up on that word, and you back away, and it doesn't produce fruit. Why? Because you quit. You give up on that. Remember, it's like the seed that's beginning to work underground, and then you dig it up and throw it away. Now, what's interesting in this passage is it says he falls away. The King James says he's offended. The person is offended. The word offend means to put a stumbling block in the way upon which another may fall. You, you become offended. You trip and fall over those thoughts that your relatives are putting in your mind. It's a stumbling block. See, Jesus was a stumbling block to some. When you speak truth... People that don't want to receive it, it's a stumbling block to them. They're tripping all over it. They're falling over. Okay? It's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be a stepping stone where you're growing higher and more mature in the things of the Lord. Now, in our illustration, like I said, of the family members, they're allowing those thoughts to trip them up. They become offended. Now, the word offense or being offended in the Greek is generally used scandalon. And it originally was the name of the part of a trap in which the bait is attached. The devil baits traps for you. Why? To try to get you to pick up an offense. As a mature believer, you and I should never become offended. Because then I'm allowing something to trip me up. If after the service today you came up and said, Hey, Pastor Scott... Some of the things you said today really offended me. Why? In other words, what you're saying is what I said is causing you to trip up and fall in your walk with the Lord. I, if I got up here and I said, Jesus is not the Son of God, you don't have salvation through him, find another way. That shouldn't offend you. Okay, because we have a, 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 a misunderstanding of what offense is, what, what the word offended means here in this passage. What you're saying is that the lie that I told caused you to trip up and stumble and fall in your faith and walk with the Lord. Now, if you're an immature believer, unfortunately, that may cause you to stumble and fall. But as a mature believer who knows God's word, you should never be offended over anything. But we're so quick and easy to pick up an offense, and it causes a stumbling block in our own life. If, let's say that Jay came up to me, and he said, you know, um, I think we should go. I got a great idea. I think we should do this, go this way as a church. I, I really believe this is what we're supposed to do. I'm like, hey, thanks for the input. Uh, talk to the board. Talk to Lou. We pray about it and just decide, you know, we, we just don't believe that that's the right direction to go. At this point, Jay has a decision to make. He can either 
say, you know what, I just wanted to share that. You just, you're, you're going that way. I'm, I'm, I got your back. I'm 100%. I'm with you. Doesn't get offended. Or, you know what, I really, I thought I, I had prayed about that, and they're not going my direction. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get upset, and I'm going to hold a grudge, or I'm going to get ticked off. They're picking up an offense, and what happens, they're tripping and stumbling over that. It's going to hinder their spiritual walk. Some people kind of cloud it in spirituality. You know, and I've prayed about this, or the Lord spoke to me, and so if you don't go that way, you're missing it. You're not the spiritual one. And then if you don't go their direction, they get an attitude, you know? And I'm, I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm going to go to another church. I don't like this direction. I, I don't like this. I don't like that. You know, I'm going somewhere else. And what happens, they'll be okay there for a little while. Then they'll get offended over something there, and they're going to go somewhere else. And then somewhere else and somewhere else until they deal with the root issue in their own heart. So nothing, here's the thing. I, there's nothing, my attitude should be, there's nothing you can say or do to me that's going to get me to stumble in my walk with the Lord. If you tell me you hate me, you don't like me, you know, it's like, I, I might be hurt. I mean, I, I would want you to like me, but I'm, why would I let you cause my walk with the Lord to be hindered? That makes no sense. And we should live that way. Love one another. We still get along, okay? But let's not become offended. And, and it's over some of the, the dumbest little things. I mean, I, it shouldn't matter to me what, how you come across, okay? Let, let's say I don't, I don't agree with, with tattoos. I don't have a problem with tattoos, okay? I don't have an issue with that. Again, some are like, well, the Bible says this. Okay, let's look at Scripture in context of what it's talking about. But I don't have an issue with it. But let's say I do. And Harold decides to get 14 tattoos and a nose ring. Okay? And he comes into my office, Pastor Scott, let me show you my new tattoos on my arms and my back. And, you know, look at my nose ring. You know? <laughs> Diane's got a chain hook to it. and can take him wherever he wants to go. I may not agree with it, and it may not be for me. I'm not going to get offended over it. It's like, hey, Harold, great, good design. You know, who did your work? You know, what does the ink mean to you? Why did you have it done? And I don't know, I've always wanted a tattoo. So I got Diane all the way across my back, you know, and other things. So great. But see, that's where if I don't, as believers, here's where convictions come into play. We try to force our convictions that are based upon our upbringing and how we interpret certain things. If, if convictions were always from the Holy Spirit, we'd all have the same ones. But it's not. I mean, some people, and especially years ago, not so much today, but, you know, you can't go to movies. Other people will go to movies. You go to movies, and I don't believe in it, let's say, so what? You go to your movies, enjoy them. I'm not going to get offended over it. We're still going to be friends. We're still going to be getting along. Okay, you, we just, we got to get rid of the, the petty things. Now, they're always, they've always been there. They're always going to be there. I just want you to rise above it. And when things come up that you don't agree with or you don't necessarily like, don't get an attitude over it. Go to pray and use it as a stepping stone to higher ground as a mature believer and still keep the peace and the joy of the Lord in your heart, okay? Otherwise, if you don't, let's say you're right. You're even right about your opinion and what you want, and I'm wrong, and I choose not to go that direction and do that. Don't get offended over it, okay? We can still all walk in love together and still move forward. Now, when you start to get to unbiblical things, and if I would get up and say, Jesus is not the Son of God, he's not the only way to salvation, you know, then, yeah, you need to sit down and have a, we need to have a talk about that, we need to discuss these things, and then it's like, you know what, I, I think maybe I do need to find another place to go to church that's preaching God's word. And that's fine, but even if I do that, I'm doing it with the right heart, not out of an offense, Remember, make decisions not based on you being offended or hurt or wounded in some way and going somewhere else. No, make decisions upon the peace of God in your heart and the direction from his word and the leading of the Holy Spirit. 
Then you're doing it right and you're staying in his will. Otherwise, you do it differently because you're hurt and you pick up your marbles and go home. You just moved yourself outside of God's help in that situation. Because he's here. I want to bless you, help you here, and you're hanging out over there with your marbles. Okay? Pick up your marbles and come back with a good attitude. Let God keep working on your heart in that situation. So I, I, I don't want you to be stony. I don't want you to be the path, the hard path. And I don't want you to be thorny either. Now next week we're going to pick up, we're going to talk about that thorny path and get into the good soil so that you're able to see God's word produced in your life every single day.